Hey folks, Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Another month has shot by. If you're interested in what's been going on in the world of uh, UK motorcycling for the month of April 2021, stick around, stay tuned. We've got five MCNs to go through. Grab yourself a brew, let's do bike news. Alrighty then, a potentially packed edition of Bike News for you this month because uh, for some reason the way the timing's worked out, got five editions as I said to get through and quite a lot of stories as well. Lots been going on in the world of motorcycles here in the UK. So uh, as I say, grab yourself a brew, this could go on for a little while. Alright, first story here, seen a lot of this in social media and the press, videos and stuff over the last month. This is the new Triumph TE1, uh, the headline here, the TE1 we've been waiting for. Now Triumph of uh, talked about getting into electric motorcycles for a while now. It was a couple of years ago that they first mentioned that they were going to do some joint development uh, on a bike, uh, for the, uh, an electric bike, with the likes of uh, Williams and Warwick University. So they've got some proper brains involved in this. I'm not saying that uh, Triumph don't have proper brains themselves, but uh, uh, they are making some progress. And uh, in the last month, they gave us a bit of an update on what's going on, showed us some artless impressions of the bikes and so on. And I have to say, it looks really good. And the numbers that they're talking about are incredible. It sounds like they've really understood what we want from electric bikes. Maybe that's why it's taking so long to develop this, I don't know. And what I mean by that is they're paying attention to charging times, they're paying attention to the way the bike looks, they're paying attention to weight, they're paying attention to cost, they're paying attention to range. All the things that uh, potentially could put you off um, buying an electric bike, or well, certainly those that have come out so far. So a couple of uh, highlights here that I've picked out from the article. So working with an array of British companies, including Williams Advanced Engineering, Integral Powertrain, and Warwick Manufacturing uh, Group from the University of Warwick, uh, they've come up with this uh, motorcycle. Um, they said the challenge is that people want something that gives them the performance of an internal combustion engine bike, but they don't want to pay a huge premium. Absolutely agree. Uh, you know, it's got to be at least as good, hasn't it? And a, and a similar price, or it's got to be better in a similar price. Um, uh, Triumph add, it has to be at a price point where there's enough people willing to pay for it, and that of course is the case. So far electric bikes have been very, very expensive. Some of the highlights of this, 174 brake horsepower equivalent peak power, so up there with uh, you know the super nakeds of today. Weight close to 220 kilograms, which again, not I mean it is heavy, but it's not super heavy, it's not out of the ballpark. 120 miles effective range, again it doesn't sound like a huge amount, but in reality for this sort of bike, you're not going to want more than 120 miles range. Those are the sorts of distances we do on a Sunday blast, maybe. Um, and able to go from 0 to 80% charge in just 20 minutes. So again, uh, a great, you know, great sounding figures there. And the looks of the bike from these artist impressions look brilliant. It looks like a slimmed down, uh, more futuristic uh, speed triple, which isn't a bad thing. So yeah, cannot wait to see when they actually get, um, you know, a production version of this bike out. They're talking relatively soon, actually. Um, be really brilliant to see the actual finished bike and, uh, and hopefully have a go on it in the future as well. So uh, thumbs up to Triumph for that one. They seem to be listening to what we want from electric bikes. Let's hope that can be something from a mainstream manufacturer that really kicks off. All right, next uh, story here, BMW R18, the big old cruiser. Remember that bike? Uh, there's a custom version of it now available from um, celebrated German bike builder, Marcus Voltz. Uh, he's now making uh, customized versions of the bike for just under 30 grand. An expensive bike anyway, around about 21 grand, uh, but he'll customize it for you. So potential customers can either buy a ready-made bike, he's apparently got a stock of brand new R18s all ready for conversion, or you can supply your own for conversion. Um, and they come with the special engine and numbered plaques and all sorts of other bits and pieces and the cost is say £28,225 or around 10k more than the standard R18. So I think it looks really cool is why I, why I pulled this article out. I think it looks really good but uh, it's interesting I rode the R18 recently and, or not that recently actually it was, no, it was in the winter but the videos went up relatively recently and the overwhelming number of comments on the R18 actually were negative which surprised me because I thought it was a cool looking bike uh, and not as bad to ride as you might think but uh, yeah I'll be surprised I don't know how many of these of these uh, Marcus Volts is like to sell. I'm sure he'll sell the allocation to a few rich collectors. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure whether BMW is barking up the right tree with the R18. We'll see. I personally enjoyed riding it, but uh, would I buy one? No. Would you buy one? Going by the comments, it seems possibly not. I hope I'm proved wrong. I'm glad that the bike exists, but I'm not sure it's quite hit the spot. More on R18 variants later. Okay, next story here. Smart spec for less than £3,000. Now this is a Lextec motorcycle. Um, it says here, Lexmoto have updated their popular LXR125, promising a fresh engine, new graphics, updated suspension, and even a TFT dash. And that's all for under £3,000. It's Euro 5 compliant, and it puts out 12.3 brake horsepower, which isn't a lot, but it's about the going rate for a 125cc bike. Reason I mention this is I think this looks great. And I think I'm right in saying that this has been the best selling 
selling or one of the best selling 125s in the last year. I'm not sure, but I've got a vague feeling that's the case. But uh, my reason for mentioning this is, you know, ignore Chinese bikes at your peril. I still get comments when I ride Chinese bikes or Chinese base bikes or bikes that are built in China by existing manufacturers or well-known manufacturers that, you know, it's Chinese, therefore it's rubbish. Well, that ain't the case. Um, and okay, they used to be rubbish and made of cheese for sure, but in the last 10 years, they've come on a long way. So ignore Chinese bikes at your peril. This Lextech, I think, looks pretty good uh, and at less than three grand as well. You can't argue with the value, can you? All right, next up, I'll be interested to hear what you think. Do you think Chinese bikes are now coming of age or do you think I'm wrong and actually they are still best avoided? I'll be riding some more Chinese bikes soon, so stay tuned to the channel. All right, next up here from the letters page, I keep hitting the honker <laughs> is the title here. And this is a, an email comes from somebody called Peter Battersby. And I this drew my attention because this is something that very much I agree with. And it's something that gets commented on on the videos I do where I review Hondas all the time. Now, as you may know, sometimes when I have a bike for long-term review, I'll do the sort of pros and cons of the bike. Um, and on Hondas, I, I sometimes, but not always, mention the fact that the um, horn and the indicator are the other way around to what they are on every other bike. Now, I don't mention it because I used to mention it. It is a pain, uh, but you just sort of accept that's what Honda do. Well, why do they do that? And that is what uh, Peter Battersby is saying here. A request to the mighty Honda, please put the horn button back where it should be. I absolutely echo that. I have no idea why Honda do it differently to anybody else what do they think they're doing uh, it should absolutely be the other way around when you ride various bikes as i'm lucky enough to do so having the horn and the indicator the wrong way around always catches you out which is why it makes me look a numpty half the time because i'm riding along on a honda and suddenly you'll hear me press the horn when actually i'm looking for the indicator don't know why honda do that if you know why they do that let me know but i wish they'd change it back and put it the same way around as everybody else makes no sense to me all right swiftly moving on after that little whinge new dog Old tricks. Could a 20-year-old recipe for success be the saviour of the super sport class? And this is pitting the Aprilia RS660, new bike I've yet to ride, against the 2001 Honda CBR600F, which you can pick up used for about 3,000 quid. Now, I think the old Honda looks brilliant still. Uh, it looks very much like the uh, SP1 that I rode a while back, uh, but of course it's in 650 guys. I think it looks excellent and probably equally as nice as the Aprilia to be honest, which also looks excellent and I'm, I'm sure rides beautifully. Let's see what the verdict was uh, comparing the two. Uh, Dan Sutherland, the reporter here from MCN, says that bikes like the Honda CBR600F Sport still deliver a fun factor unsurpassed by Honda's own current mid-size CBR offering. You just have to work the inline four engine a little harder than the RS to unlock it. Find a good one and it could be the bargain of the year. I tend to agree, I've mentioned this before on Bike News and other videos, that I would love to get some older bikes uh, and this is exactly the sort of bike that I think would hit the sweet spot. The CBR650R, uh, you know, you can ride properly on the road, you can use pretty much all of its engine without going at ridiculous speeds. You can have an awful lot of fun on this for not a lot of money if you can find a good one. That's the key. My problem is, and this is a great problem to have, I realise, so I'm not expecting sympathy here, because I just haven't got room in the garage. I keep thinking, am I going to have to sell some of my bikes? I just can't move in there at the moment. Um, so uh, I don't know where I'd keep a CBR 650R if I had one. If only I had a farm or something uh, that I could keep them on. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that looks great. And um, basically, it just, again, makes the point that you don't have to spend huge money on a brand new bike to get a bike that gives you oodles of enjoyment if you just want to ride one for fun, or indeed transport, um, through this summer. So yeah, CBR 650R, the old one, 2001 price, it was 6,850. So it was expensive back then, but as I say, you can pick them up second hand now for about three grand if you can find one. All right, final story in the first paper. Go black to the future. Latest Ducati Street Fighter V4S gets more punch and a moody new paint job. Now, I love the uh, Street Fighter V4. Um, uh, again, I made some videos on this. If I remember, I'll, I'll stick a link in the corner uh, to my videos. This is a bike that, again, if I had room in the garage and spare cash, I would definitely buy one of these. I love the V4S. It's got all the fun factor and the kudos and the glamour of the uh, Ducati um, V4 Panigale, but in a much more accessible form in that you've got that upright riding position, much more comfortable, much more practical bike. Uh, if I were starting over my bike collection, if you can call it that again, I would probably do away with uh, my Street Triple and I would have this. In fact, I'm still sort of toying with that idea now. Uh, and I think it looks great in black. I do think that Ducati's 
have to be red really so i'm not sure whether i'd actually buy the black over the red but this bike does look particularly good um, what some of the highlights i've pointed out here the uh, new street fighter now has a self-bleeding brake and clutch master cylinder well that's something we didn't know we needed did we but it sounds like it's an improvement brilliant um the desmo sedici stradale v4 now makes its 90 foot pounds of torque which was the same as before at just 9500 rpm instead of 11500 rpm so the tune now is a bit further down a bit more accessible for use on the road so that's good news uh, it says here now it feels more alive and urgent at road speeds compared to the peak year 2020 model which is the one i rode which i thought felt pretty alive at road speeds anyway so yeah only only improving the bike it seems and now available in black too all right there we go that was it for the first paper okay next up then what we've we got here only three stories i picked out of this uh, edition of the paper a little bit thin feeling maybe not much happening that particular week um, what have we got here? Ducati Recall Multistrada V4. Yes, this was a big story uh, a few weeks back when, uh, you know, the the new V4 Multistrada, an amazing looking bike, haven't ridden that one yet either, but I hope I will do. It uh, turns out had some uh, issues with some of the engines and people were being offered brand new engines as part of the recall. What an incredible thing. I mean, recalls are a nightmare for everybody concerned, aren't they? It's, uh, it's inconvenient for us. If you've got to have the engine replaced, that's going to be away for a while. It means you're going to be without the bike, which is uh, not good. But uh, if it's a pain for you, think what a pain it is for the manufacturer, how much the recalls cost them. So kudos to Ducati for making this recall happen. Uh, some of the things I've pointed out from the article here. So it turns out there's an issue with valve guides where, whereby substandard items are prone to premature wear, which could result in a loss of power or failure of the engine to start. Ducati has narrowed the problems down to a single batch of valve guides, and as a result, only a percentage of the bikes that have been produced are affected, so it's not every bike by all means. MCN understands owners who have already taken delivery of bikes that are in the affected batch will be offered new engines. Absolutely incredible. I don't know if they have to go back to the factory or whether your dealer does that, but uh, sounds like major surgery, doesn't it? But uh, thumbs up to Ducati for making that happen um, but what a pain if you happen to have bought one of those bikes which are by all accounts epic bikes I've not seen a bad review of the new uh, Multistrada V4 so shame that it's been hit with that recall already oh next story I couldn't miss this because uh, this is the uh, new light lock core from channel sponsors light locks got a big um, article here uh, in mcn all about it um, and the brit firm claim world's lightest flexible gold rated security is that is the headline here so basically they put a load of uh, technology into the light lock a lock that i've been using well before the company sponsored me they brought out a new version now again i made a video on this recently i'll put a link in the corner of this uh, and anyway they've put a load of thought new technology into it and the outcome of that is a portable lock that weighs just two and a half kilograms but still achieves the sole secure gold rating for motorcycle security. Traditional security chains that make the grade typically weigh more like six kilograms. So it's way less than the equivalent security chain. Yes, I know all locks can be defeated. I know there's things on the internet you can go and watch where it even tells you how to do that, which I think is absolutely outrageous. It's all about um, deterrence for me. If your bike is harder to pinch than the one next to it, they'll pinch the one next to it. I personally uh, do use the light lock, have been doing so long before the company sponsored me. And if you are interested in one of these new versions of the lock, the light lock core, I can get you you a discount there's a link below 10% if you follow 10% uh, off if you follow the link below they're on pre-order at the moment you won't get them till September um, but you can get 10% off so it'll cost you 135 quid instead of 150 for what is I think a market leading lock that is portable and uh, as secure as locks get anyway there we go advert over right move, not really an advert but you know what I'm saying all right moving on next story here simply the best uh, this is the uh, new BMW uh, R1250 RTLE that uh, uh, MCN have been testing. Now this is a bike that lots of people have said, when am I going to get uh, and ride one of these? I did a review of the original, well not the original, but the 1200RT um, a few years back now, probably about three years ago. Got massive views and uh, was a very popular video and I loved the bike as well. Um, really beautiful to ride, but uh, my issue I had with the old RT was just the, the looks of it. The front end just looked really bulbous to me. When BMW brought out this newer version they've redesigned the front which is great and i'm not sure it looks it looks that great but uh, the more i look at the pictures the more it's starting to grow on me now it so happens i am going to get one of these bikes for review bmw are very kindly going to lend me one for a couple of weeks i think uh, next week or the week after it's coming so i will get to uh, ride one of these a lot and i'll bring you my in-depth review my first ride all that sort of stuff that i usually do when i get the longer term loan bikes and i'm wondering whether when i get to ride it and get to see it in the flesh whether the looks are going to grow on me more i hope they do because i think the RT is a beautiful touring bike. It'll be very interesting too to see how it compares to my new Goldwing, which in 
cost terms, the Goldwing is a lot more expensive. A brand new Goldwing like mine is 30 grand plus. The, uh, the RT is around about the 20 grand mark, depending on the extras you have. So really looking forward to riding this. Really looking forward to seeing um, whether those looks have improved when you see it in the flesh. Looking forward to trying out that big new TFT dash that everybody raves about. And of course, the cruise control radar on it. What's the verdict that MCN have said? Unflustered, relaxing and spacious. That's the sort of touring bike I like. Uh, it's got surprising grip and an appetite for big lean. So far so good. The new display makes every other dash look weedy but isn't. Active cruise control can be handy but irritating in equal measure. So we'll see how that works. Uh, gadgets aside, the 2021 machine is the same RT we all know and love and still the best all round tourer money can buy. Well, I might take issue with that having bought a Goldwing. But uh, of course, when you're looking at value for money, it might be that this is better value for money because it is, as I say, a third cheaper than an equivalent Goldwing. And this, uh, you know, it looks like it's laden with all the latest tech, including that um, radar cruise control, which I'm not sure about. I've not used a bike with that yet, so again, looking forward to trying that. They've given it five stars, so you know, their highest mark, which is brilliant. So looking forward to having a go on that. All right, there we go. That was that for the second paper. A bit thin, that one. Moving on then, we've got uh, five stories in, uh, in this third paper from the month. Whoops, if you can find the first one. Here we go. New KTM is a carbon-clad beast. Limited edition Super Duke RR drops nine kilograms from stock and is brimming with tech. So what do you think of this? It looks amazing, doesn't it? I like the Super Duke R anyway. And it looks like uh, KTM have done a bit of a weight loss exercise here. So they've stripped out every gram of fat while tuning the ele electronics to the max. Uh, everything that can be carbon fibre is carbon fibre. Uh, the result is a bike that weighs nine kilograms less than the standard model. Um, it's got, the RR comes with adjustable controls throughout, a titanium Akropovich slip-on and a quick action throttle, reduction in traction control intervention in all modes, sport mode has been replaced with performance mode, um, KTM are making just 500 of these globally and uh, they've got a near 22k price tag they're expecting them to sell out fast. So basically it's got the same engine I think as before um, but um, they've uh, reduced weight so it makes it you know a, a better bike but when you think about it Eight kilograms of, of weight loss, sorry, nine kilograms of weight loss is pretty good going. What is that? That's um, 18 pounds, that's a stone and a half-ish, something like that, isn't it? I sometimes wonder whether actually you'd be better off just losing your weight yourself. I know that's easier said than done, but when you uh, you know look at the general population out there and, um, and bikers in general, some of them, without being too rude, do look a little bit um, as if they're squeezed into their leathers. It might be easier just to lose a bit of weight rather than uh, spell, spend the extra on the lightest KTM you can possibly get, or maybe do both, maybe that's the answer. Anyway, what do you think of this? Would you buy one of these? I think it looks lovely. Okay, moving on then. Next story, oh, another one of these R18 stories I mentioned earlier, uh, and, I, and I get that maybe people don't like the R R18, but this is interesting now, because uh, size matters for BMW's new R18s. They've spotted, they've got some spy shots here of some new bikes. So the next two R18 models, dubbed the R18B and the R18 Transcontinental, have been spied. Uh, they're going to dwarf even the current R18, uh, apparently, and the classic, with dimensions that only the largest Harleys can dream of. Uh, Size-wise, the B is 2,560 uh, millimetres long, making it 85 mil longer than a Goldwing. Uh, and the Transcontinental stretches that to 2,640 millimetres, so even longer. Now, they're saying this as if it's, as if it's somehow a virtue. I'm not sure just being big is a good thing for a bike. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, I'm a Goldwing. Uh, fan because I bought one last year um, and okay it is nice to have a big bike when you're two up but generally speaking it makes a bike harder to live with moving it in and out of the garage is difficult uh, generally bigger bikes are a pain they have their place plainly but uh, being big per se I don't think is necessarily a virtue anyway uh, the R18B is expected to weigh in at 400 kilograms and the transcontinental 430 kilograms so not only are they longer than the Goldwing they're significantly um, heavier too. Um, I don't know about this. I, I just uh, it doesn't appeal to me. What do you think of this? Is this your sort of bike? The picture here makes it look like one of those sort of touring Harleys. Uh, I must get more up to date on my Harley Davidsons. More on that soon. Um, but. Um, yeah, that one doesn't do it for me. Uh, and the fact that it's big and heavy, uh, I don't know. I hope it's got a better reverse gear than the original R18 had, uh, which I couldn't get to work. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see what it looks like in the flesh. This is still obviously a development prototype. Maybe it'll look better once it gets some nice colors and so on. And there are a place for bikes for everyone, but nah, not for me, this one, I don't think. Okay, moving on. 
What have we got here? Ah, a letter. Tall seat, get bigger boots is the uh, is the letter. This is from somebody called Richard Pavelko. Uh, hope I've got your surname right there, Richard, if you're watching. Uh, he said he visited a cobbler and asked for a thick commando sole to be put on his motorcycle boots. These are up to eight millimetres thick, apparently. He also got a fitted cushioned insole, which is available up to nine mil uh, thick. So for about 30 quid, he now feels more in control and the boots will never wear out. So he's got an additional 60, 17 mil of height he's gained just by thickening up the bottom of his boots. That's pretty impressive. Um, something worth considering if you're a, maybe a shorter rider and struggling to get your feet on the deck and you can't get loud suspension, or you don't want to mess about with geometry on bikes or start hacking the seats about, just wear higher shoes. Good excuse as any. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're talking platforms here, not stilettos. So um, another, what does I say, 17 mil is possible. I mean, that could make all the difference from a bike feeling you know, like it's going to drop or actually being usable. So uh, great idea from Richard. Thank you for that one. Thought it was worth pointing out as we skim through. Right, next story. New middle order. Can the all-new Triumph Triumph 660 topple Yamaha's updated MT-07? So they've done one of their head-to-head -head comparisons here of the uh, of the Trident versus the MT-07. Now the Trident I recently rode, you may have seen my videos of that, uh, really liked it. I'm not too sure about the looks personally, but it's a, it's a lovely, lovely bike to ride, laden with technology and great value for money. The MT-07 is one of those bikes that sort of passed me by. When it came out a while back now, um, it, uh, it got rave reviews and I quite liked it when I rode it, but it's, not, it's nothing special, it's just a bit sort of meh. Uh, anyway, Yamaha have updated it now, uh, which to me looks like they've just changed the front end, the light on it, and I think they've it doesn't look good to me. Maybe again, it looks better in the flesh. Sometimes bikes do, but this front end upgrade they've done just looks horrible to me. So for me, the Trident would definitely win that. The MT-07 is a little bit cheaper, but only marginally. Uh, anyway, let's see what um, MCN said in their verdict. So the MT is still brilliant, but the Trident has moved the game on. Um, the Trident is amazingly well-priced, looks great, responds well, and there's enough tech to make you feel it is con a contemporary bike and not a bit hold at, old hat which is the issue that the MT still suffers from. So MCN is saying the MT-07 feels a bit old hat now. Um, the Yamaha, Yamaha feel like they're resting on their laurels, doing the bare minimum and assuming the sale success would continue. Um, Triumph were handed an open goal and the Trident has smashed the ball right into the back of the net. So yeah, quite a damning uh, comparison there. Interestingly, they MCN give both bikes four stars, having slammed the MT-07. Uh, but their, you know, their summary, I guess, was largely my feelings too, that the, uh, the Trident has just moved the game on uh, an awful lot. And I, I just don't like the, um, the way that the MT-07 looks. Again, I might be uh, in the minority here. I know all the reviews seem to rave about it, so I accept I might be wrong. I do need to ride one uh, of the new ones. It's quite difficult for uh, YouTubers to actually ride Yamahas unless you can borrow them from dealers because for some reason Yamaha don't talk to uh, to moto vloggers on YouTube I've mentioned that before moving on next one perhaps the biggest launch the biggest thing we've seen in the last month both uh, news wise and actually physically is the new Hayabusa uh, that is uh, that has emerged here we are um, I couldn't I couldn't basically uh, go through the month without talking about the Hayabusa. I didn't go to the launch of this. Suzuki very kindly said that I could go to the launch, but I just felt that um, there were there would be too many videos that were, were, were the same. And I think I was kind of proved right with that because uh, there are an awful lot of videos of people walking onto that runway in slow motion, getting on a bike and shooting off with a drone going behind them. Um, and uh, mine would just been another one of those. So I didn't go to the launch and I'm thrilled to say Suzuki have let me borrow one of these. I've got one at the moment and I've ridden it uh, yesterday for the first time. I've got a video coming up soon on that. If you stay tuned to Parish Notices at the end of this video, I'll tell you when that when that's coming up. So uh, I have now ridden the bike. Um, I'll save my verdict until you actually watch those um, those videos. Um, but I would say a few a few quick observations about it. Number one, I love the paint scheme on this. Black and gold always always wins, doesn't it? It looks absolutely beautiful in the black and gold. Sadly, the one I've got is silver, but that's by the by. Um, and the other thing that I immediately uh, warmed me to this was the dash on this. The fact that uh, Suzuki have gone modern with a small TFT in, in the middle of the display, but then they've actually got four dials still for fuel gauge, engine temperature, RPM and speedo. And I think it looks absolutely brilliant. So uh, yeah, really looking forward to getting to know the high abuse. So videos coming soon. I'll give you the dates of those in parish notices at the end of the video. Alrighty, that's it for that paper. Next one. Uh, just two stories in this paper, so uh, 
Blimey, I don't know if MCN weren't getting their finger out or whether I just wasn't paying attention. First story, Triumph's new king of cool, Steve McQueen edition Scrambler 1200 unveiled alongside updates. Now this does look lovely, doesn't it? Beautiful um, green and gold version of the Triumph Scrambler. This is the big 1200 version. Got Steve McQueen um, signatures on it, that sort of thing, and a few extra bits and pieces. So it says here, Triumph have released a limited edition Steve McQueen model Scrambler 1200 at the same time as updating their range topping retro scramblers to meet the latest emission standards. So this is another Euro 5 update really, plus this special edition. Uh, the special edition comes with competition green tank, brushed foil knee pads, hand painted gold pinstripes, gold heritage logos, brushed aluminium fuel cap, brushed stainless steel tank strap, and a cute little Steve McQueen graphic. It also comes with a high level mudguard. There's gonna be a thousand of them, they're all numbered, um, and they're gonna cost you 13,600 when they arrive in dealers in June, which is about a thousand quid more than the standard bike. So for that, you're basically getting a bit of uh, brushed aluminium farkles, a limited edition and a different paint job for a thousand quid more. Just keep that in your mind for later on in the review. Now I do think it looks lovely. Whether I'd pay a thousand pounds for those differences, I don't know. I do think the high level mudguard looks good by the way. They should make that standard on all the 1200s. But a thousand quid extra just sounds a little salty. But there we go, it's a limited edition, only a thousand available. Um, so I'm sure it'll fly off the shelves. Um, the new 1200 XE by the way, uh, the non Steve Bikini one is 12,600. Yeah, so exactly a thousand pounds more for the special edition. Does look lovely. Interested to see if you think it's worth a thousand quid more though. All right, next story in here. Ready for anything. It's new, but is it worth it? The new KTM 890 Adventure R ups its capacity and tech for a hardcore middleweight, middleweight adventurer. Now, I've highlighted the KTM Adventure R here because this is a bike for some reason I can't get excited about. I rode the previous version of it and I quite enjoyed it. It's very clever the way, for example, the way they store the fuel on this nice and low in these sort of bladders at the moment. Not bladders, they're made of plastic, but big fuel tanks low down. Keeps the weight low down and that's a great thing. But I can't get that excited about the way the bike looks. I don't know whether it's because I'm not a big off-road fan. I don't much care for riding off-road. Um, mainly because it hurts my shoulders, but that's a by the by. Um, so it's sort of wasted on me. Riding it as a road bike is not what it's intended for. If you like doing green lanes, off-roading, or proper around the world riding, and you're gonna do some dirt roads and stuff, then this would be perfect, I expect. But why can't I get excited about it? I don't know. How do you feel about this? Do you think this is a bike that you'd uh, find desirable in your garage? Anyway, a couple of highlights here for, uh, from the article. So the parallel twin has grown by 90 cc to 889 cc to become Euro 5 compliant again. A boost of 9.8 bhp and 8.8 foot pounds peak performance and a reworked gearbox have been added. Uh, KTM have revised their settings for the 890 and taken a bit of the off-road focus out of the road equation. Okay, uh, latest ABS software, brake master cylinder features a stronger piston spring to deliver better feel, and the rear caliper has also been tweaked. Uh, it features KTM's latest version of their traction control as well. So it's had a few tweaks as well as making it Euro 5 friendly, um, and the up in horsepower is always welcome, of course. Do you like it? What do you think? All right, there we go. That's it for those. All right, final paper for uh, this month's news review then. Then we'll get onto some parish notices with some news about uh, what's coming up on the channel and some other bits and pieces that I want to let you know. So do stay tuned uh, until after the paper review for that bit. First story here, room for dessert. Now this is another uh, um, Triumph Scrambler. This is the new Street Scrambler. Uh, and this one, uh, again, let me read out the highlighted bits here first and then I'll tell you what I think about this. So Triumph have unveiled a Euro 5 again updated version of the Street Scrambler, including this special edition. It's called the Sandstorm. Uh, the new version sacrifices none of its 64 brake horsepower peak power output. So although it's gone Euro 5 friendly, they kept the same power output. So very clever of Triumph that. So this special edition gets a three-tone paint job, high-level mudguard, uh, Aluminium bash plate, rubber knee pads, headlight grill, and tail tidy. And the Sandstorm Edition, which is what this is called, is available from May, and it's £9,900. So, does all that sound familiar? Very similar updates to that Steve McQueen bike that we just looked at. This one, though, is just £600 extra over the uh, over the standard bike. So, I think now this is becoming much more acceptable. 600 quid for a fancy paint job and a few extra bits of bling. I think that's probably worth doing. And I, for one, actually preferred the Street Scrambler when I rode it to the Big 1200. The Big 1200 is a lovely bike don't get me wrong it's beautiful if you're a, a, a tall fella you'd love it but for me at five foot eight and, and not that big I just found it too top heavy and too big to physically live with whereas the street scrambler I didn't find that it's a, it's a physically smaller bike uh, and it, it was just easier to live with I just preferred it all round so now that you can get this one yeah, a special edition for 9,900 they're only making 775 of these I think it's worth um, sniffing one of those out if you're interested in scramblers be interested again in the comments to hear what you think how do you think the Street Scrambler compares to the 1200 Scrambler? Um, do you, if you bought the Street Scrambler, would you always think, oh, I wish I went for the 1200? For me, 
I don't think I would. I think I'd feel that uh, I'd saved a few bob and got a better bike for my physical size. All right, moving swiftly on then. Small KTMs now have big ideas. Talking of KTMs as we were before, they spotted some spy shots of some new smaller capacity KTMs. So it says here, um, it's been a decade since KTM introduced the 125 Duke, the larger 250 and the 390 singles. Um, so, uh, the bike you see here is believed to be the midline 250cc model, a version that isn't offered in the UK. But if KTM follow their previous path, then the 125, 250 and 390 will be almost indistinguishable. Uh, the engine doesn't appear to share much with the existing smaller bikes. Uh, the the frame moves away from the current design and the uh, cast ally swing, swing arm has an upper brace on the left hand side that it didn't have before. So lots of changes it looks like here on the smaller end KTM bikes. The reason I fished this story out is because I love the smaller KTMs, in particular the 390 Duke. I think the 390 Duke is my second favourite of all KTMs. The Super Duke R of course is my favourite, that is a lovely bike, but the 390 Duke was brilliant. So they're bringing out a new version of it, looking forward to having a go at that one. Uh, I'll definitely see if I can borrow one of those from KTM when they're available. Um, so it's got uh, Brembo budget Vibre um, single front uh, calipers and rear calipers apparently uh, headlight doesn't appear to be the finished unit it says here there's a hint of super duke uh, about the jutting out side panels yeah so the styling is different uh, five ultra thin spokes on the wheels which have got a new design um, suspension is wp of course because ktm own wp so yeah looks good looking forward to seeing uh, when that one hits the streets definitely want to go on some of those Right, dialing up to 11. Uh, this is the, again, we talked about the Hayabusa before, a bike that I've currently got in the garage. Uh, and what they've done here is a comparison of the current bike, the new bike, with the old one, which uh, was around 22 years ago. Incredible, wasn't it? 1999, I think it was launched. Uh, they've done the, one of those comparisons. So let's see, out of interest, what they said that, that were the differences between the two. I mean, let's face it, the two look pretty similar, don't they? Um, I must admit, without giving away, um, you know, without spoiling my reviews, I don't like the look of the Hayabusa generally. Um, it just looks, it reminds me of a shell or something. I appreciate that it's aerodynamic and it makes it stable at speed, but for me, uh, the looks don't quite work. Although when you see it in the flesh, it is beautifully finished and uh, you know it's kind of growing on me with the more I ride it. Anyway, MCN's verdict on the comparison of the two. So um, its aerodynamic look is unique, as I just said. Uh, its stability at speed unmatched and above all, its engine is outstanding in how it delivers a smooth and uninterrupted roll on thrust. Smoother, more refined and packing electronic assist, the new booster is everything fans of the old model could have wished for. So basically, uh, they're not saying too much there. They're not saying the old one's better than the new, they're saying the new one's better than the old, as it should be, but it is 22 years of development. Mm, I was kind of hoping they might have done something with the looks personally. But uh, anyway, there we go. Stick around, stay tuned to my channel for more on the Booster soon. Anyway, while we're talking about that, let's move on to Parish Notices. Give you a bit of news about what's happening uh, on the channel again. Uh, let's see what's coming up. So first off, oh, got a new discount code for you. Uh, if you're quick, that is, and you're in the market for a new battery for your bike, maybe just coming out of lockdown, you want to get yourself a new battery, channel sponsors, UASA, uh, are offering until the 29th of May only, so you've got a month to do this, 10% off of their batteries. If you use the code UASA TMF10 uh, and you go to Tainer, uh, one of their authorised dealers, uh, you can get 10% off of any UASA batteries. Uh, I'll put a link below uh, to Tainer as well, so you can go and do that. Check that out if uh, if you need a new battery. Whilst on the subject of UASA, uh, they are searching for the longest living UASA battery. They've got a uh, UASA long life campaign running at the moment and they want to know how long you, your battery has been going. If you can beat 22 years with a UASA battery, then you'll be the new record holder. That's the longest they've found so far. Uh, but the interesting thing is if you've got a UASA battery that's been running for 15 years, then they'll replace it absolutely free of charge. So, uh, so that's good. So again, check out the details in the link below. If you've got a battery in your bike, that's the original and it's more than 15 years old it's a uasa you can get yourself a free replacement from if you follow the link below don't forget that 10 percent uh, off if you want to buy a new one as well from tainer uh next up oh want to mention i've recently been talking to dave from really good tv and uh so very clever really good not really good uh, dave is an irish moto vlogger lovely lovely chap uh, we had a zoom call a couple of weeks ago and he published on his uh, channel last saturday i think it was uh, the interview that we did together it was uh, just a quick 10 minute thing uh, but it, i really really enjoyed doing it i think dave is a, a, a lovely bloke i've watched all of his videos i'm just mentioning it because if you want a new channel to watch i think this one could be a massive grower go and check out the the interview that i did with him again i'll put a link if i can below or in the corner to dave's channel so you can go and watch that if you're interested uh, but yeah really good tv i think a channel to uh, to watch because uh, i think it's going to grow massively in the next few years he also did an interview with bruce as well teapot one the week before 
not as good as mine of you obviously but uh, anyway go and check that out and uh, as i say link below uh, on that one okay coming soon on the channel then what do we got? Well, uh, next week, in fact, the next video you see on Monday uh, is my is the long overdue uh, next edition of Biker Scram with Jeff and Dan. A couple of biking mates of mine, uh, we jumped on the bikes, we had a long old ride. I took the Goldwing, I hadn't ridden the Goldwing for ages. Uh, we went up to Caffeine and Machine uh, over uh, through the Cotswolds, a lovely ride out on a beautiful day. Uh, sampled their food and gave it our, our cuisine rating. Um, so do watch uh, that if you want something slightly different from the bike reviews. So it was great to meet up with Jeff and Dan again. We're gonna have to do it more often. Those videos don't get loads of views, but I just love making them because they're fun to do and it makes a change from doing bike reviews. So I'm gonna try and, now we're starting to get out of lockdown i'm going to try and do uh, more videos uh, on the channel that aren't just bike reviews i mean it's been a funny old year or two isn't it and uh, basically that's what we've been forced to do but uh, more tours more biker scrams more things like that coming along to the channel starting on monday then next after that on thursday the 6th of may uh, the first uh, review first ride of the cbr 650r now this is the sort of sports bike version of the honda 650s you may have seen my videos i put up last week of the uh, cb 650r which is the naked version lovely bike i've had the sports bike version as well that's coming up. I've already mentioned the Hayabusa videos are coming. They'll be coming up this month and I'll be doing my in-depth review, my top five things, the usual stuff. So if you're interested in the Hayabusa, hopefully they're going to give you a bit of a real world look at that bike. And there's more on the Triumph Trident coming as well. Uh, again, uh, one of the bigger launches of this year. More coming on that uh, in the next month. I've got my first ride review of the uh, Honda Fireblade. What an incredible motorcycle that is. That's coming up on the 24th of May and then more to follow. Uh, the next bike news, if you want to make a note in your diary, that will be on May the 31st and they'll probably be maybe one or two little bonus videos as well there's a few things festering that might happen in the month that i might pop out an additional video on talking of which a huge thank you to everybody that watched my um 200 000 subscriber special video that was an extra bonus video i wasn't planning on doing because i didn't know when i was going to hit 200 000 subscribers went up in the airplane made a video there uh, and uh, actually got more views than i thought so thank you very much for everybody that sent their best wishes it's uh, much appreciated and thank you for getting me to 200 000 subscribers absolutely incredible don't forget to follow me if you don't already on Instagram, Twitter, or Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, in that order. I'm most active on Instagram, and then Facebook, and then Twitter, which I don't do much on. Um, uh, that's the way to keep up to date with what I'm doing on any particular day. It's sort of more real time. So uh, I'm trying to build my uh, following on those social media platforms in case something went pear-shaped with YouTube, as it does for some vloggers. Um, then, uh, then that's the way you're gonna find me. So follow me on Instagram if you can. Massive, massive thanks, as ever, to uh, all my patrons and members. Without you guys, uh, I could not make Make the videos that I do as often as I do here on YouTube so thank you big thumbs up uh, for my patrons for following along if you want to if you want to get involved then uh, again follow the link in the corner and uh, and join up to the patron or member crew and uh, that's pretty much it I think for uh, for this time so thanks as ever for watching hope you enjoyed that hope I haven't waffled on too long stick your comments below on any of the stories uh, that I've talked about be fascinated to hear if you agree or disagree with me all right that's it for this time look forward to speaking to you again soon until then this has been the Mr. Fly cheerio